Okay, we're going to start by quickly going through the re uh, exercise for the dealing with confounders that I left for homework that you may or may not have done. Uh, we're basically running the same analysis as you did before, only for uh, the reads data. We're just going to go through the figures. So the for the reads, just the counts is extremely noisy and you really can't see anything in it. Logging it, you can only separate one individual from the other two. They're still very mixed up. But uh, notably, that's much less obvious that there's ex uh, bad batch effects because there's so much additional noise from other sources that it's sort of obscuring the batch effects. So in this case, RAVG doesn't really make much difference over just log transforming and size and library size normalizing. RAVS looks a little different, but um, not really better um, from these PCA plots. Combat still gets rid of everything. All the variabilities, you just get one big cloud on the step. And then in, in this case, actually sort of separates the different individuals, but you can still see that there are batch effects here. So the, the pink squares are definitely in a different position than these brown squares. And you still see that for the other individuals as well. So, but it, it has at least preserved the biological signal. And the GLM has not. Uh, but perform the GLM on the individuals still keeps the one individual separate, but these two individuals do not separate from each other. Uh, and that just still doesn't show a lot of improvement. So doing batch effect correction actually improves the RLE a little bit for uh, the reads, which wasn't obvious for the OMIs. And then looking at these uh, plots, we can see uh, so once you do library size normalization, then the variance explained by total features uh, goes down, but not the batch effects. And we see RUVG does not affect the batch effects at all, but does reduce the signal from individual. So it's probably unhelpful in this case. And RUVS uh, actually does something fairly similar, but it's reducing both the batch effects and the signal from the individual. That's not, not particularly helpful either. Um, Combat has gotten rid of all the batch effects and all the signal from individuals. Uh, whereas MNN uh, has slightly reduced the batch effect, but not very much, but has preserved the signal from the individuals much more than the other methods. And the GLM by this scale actually looks like it's doing, that one seems to be missing some lines from it. Uh, so the GLM individual, again, the individual and the batch are now completely overlapping. Um, and so it has some, some signal there, but uh, not a whole lot of signal for the individual. And we do k bats. And now uh, it's a different individual this time that doesn't seem to normalize well um, based on k bats. But all of the methods look like they're doing something at least, um, but not very much beyond what you get from just doing the library size normalization here for the reads. The reads are, are much harder to batch correct than, uh, than the UMIs were. So now we're going to move on to biological analysis. <coughs> I'll hand it over to Vlad to look at clustering.
Can you hear me? Good. So any, any questions so far from the previous chapter? No? Okay, so today we're going to have a mo more biological day. So there will be more downstream analysis of the data and uh, we will look at different uh, biological aspects that we can define uh, from our data. So the first one is the most popular uh, thing that you could do with your RNA-seq data is uh, to cluster it. So, uh <coughs> so we provide here some clustering introduction. Um, so usually uh, in application to single cell RNA-seq data, clustering helps you to define uh, cell types that you might have in your data set. Um, so there are lots of papers which uh, try to define cell types. Usually you would define some things uh, already known, but there is a hope that there is something else, some new cell type that you can discover and publish. So that's, that's, that's usually the motivation uh, for doing clustering in single cell RNA-seq data. Um, so basically clustering, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's you just want to uh, put cells in different groups uh, and these groups will, would have different properties. And you would do that in an unsupervised manner. So you don't want to use any prior knowledge. So you want to be objective. Uh, so you're putting your cells in those groups and those groups will be your clusters or cell types. Uh, usually before doing that, uh, it's, it's, it's good to reduce the dimensionality of your data. So for that, you, you could use different dimensionality reduction approaches. So we considered a uh, couple of them yesterday. So one is PCA, where you reduce uh, dimensions of your data to whatever number you want. So we, we looked at two principal components yesterday. Um, uh, also, you can use TSNE, as I mentioned yesterday, but that's not uh, advisable. Um, so, and the, the, uh, the reason behind that is that if you want to compare cells between each other, uh, because they have, in human genome, you have 20,000 genes, so your dimensions is 20,000. and uh, in, in, in such a high dimension, dimensional space, uh, the distances between the cells become negligible. So all of them will be very similar. If, even if the cells are very different from each other, in the high dimensional space, they will look very similar. So we want to reduce the dimensions to, to be able to find the differences between the cells, right? <coughs> um, so that's, that's the first step. That you, you should always do dimensionality reduction on single cell RNA-seq data. The second step is clustering itself. So once you reduce dimensions to some reasonable size, then you can use clustering algorithms uh, to sort the cells into groups. Um, so here we, I will talk about unsupervised clustering. There are several algorithms you can use. Some examples are hierarchical clustering, k-means clustering and graph-based clustering. Um, so I will go through, through these uh, types of clustering. So in hierarchical clustering, you can either use bottom-up or uh, top-down uh, top approach. Uh, so in this case, you would imagine that you have cells in your experiment. So then you would start, you would put each cell into a separate cluster. And then by looking at the distances between the cells, you would merge similar cells together into one group. And this, this is how you will create a hierarchy in, in your data set. So in this case, uh, this clustering doesn't give you a single solution, but it will give you a hierarchy uh, of your data. And you can cut this tree at different levels. And depending on where you cut it, you can get different number of clusters in your data set. <coughs> the second uh, popular algorithm is k-means. 
Um, so in k means, is the goal is uh, to partition your cells into k different clusters. So when you run k means, you have to define the number of clusters that you want to get. So this is an input parameter. Uh, and then once you say, I want, for example, I want three clusters, right? Uh, it will first find uh, cluster centers on the first in the first iteration. And then it will, um, in an iterative manner, so it will, it will do several iterations. It will recalculate uh, clus cluster centers based on the cells around it every time basically moving it a bit. And once it converges, you will get your clustering solution. But here, the, the disadvantage of this method is that you have to define number of clusters before running the algorithm. And usually, you never know what's, what's the number of clusters in your data. Another approach is graph-based methods. Um, so in this case, you, you create a network uh, where uh, the, the, the nodes would be your cells and the edges would be connection between them, distances between them. And then there are several graph-based algorithms where you can go through this network and find out uh, the nearest neighbors, for example, for each cell. And this will give you an idea of what, what is the structure of your data. <coughs> yeah, so one advantage of graph-based method is that uh, uh, because of some approximations that you can use, you can apply these methods to very large data sets. So if you want to calculate uh, distances uh, accurately, this will take a lot of time. Whereas in these methods, you can, you can actually do clusterings much faster. Uh, so what are the challenges in single cell RNAC clustering? Uh, so the first one is the number of clusters is unknown. So we, we, want, we want to be objective, so we don't want to say how many clusters we have in advance. Then the second question is, is more philosophical question. What is a cell type? So once you define your clusters, can you say that this cluster is a new cell type? Or is it an artifact of your data? Or is it just another state of some existing cell type? So what is a cell type is still, uh, is still a question. Uh, and now there are efforts to tackle this question. For example, human cell atlas. Um, I think this is, this is the main purpose of it, is to define a cell type and then uh, characterize cell types in the human body. Um, the second problem is scalability. So in the last few years, the number of cells in single cell experiments increased up to one million. And probably there will be more cells in, in an experiment in the next couple of years. So some algorithms are very slow, so you cannot apply them to one million cells at all. Um, some algorithms work very nicely on larger data sets, but not on smaller data sets. So there are some, uh, there is no universal algorithm that can be used for all small data set and uh, for large data set at the same time. Um, so these tools are not user friendly. This is probably out of date already. So there's been, I think at the moment there are quite, uh, quite a large number of clustering <coughs> tools that you can use. And they are user friendly. The only problem is, uh, this is related to the previous uh, topic on bioconductor. So some of the tools are compatible with the single cell experiment class that we used yesterday. Some of them are not, so you have to uh, create a, an expression matrix from your data set first and then use it as an input for clustering tool. Some data, some clustering algorithms were, uh, work in Python, so you have to output your data set to a text file and then run Python separately. So, uh, so there are some issues here because of that, but this is this is a general problem. It's not it's not probably not related to clustering specifically. Um, so we will cover couple, several tools uh, 
for single cell RNA seq data, which are mostly R based tools. Um, so the first one is called Sincera. This is already quite old tool, and it's quite straightforward because it's based on hierarchical clustering. Um, there is some uh, normalization of your data set before doing clustering, but after that, it's a simple hierarchical clustering. The second tool is called PCA Reduce. It combines dimensionality reduction using PCA, k-means clustering, and some iterative hierarchical clustering. So if you are interested, you can look at into details in this paper. Um, so this, this one is also iterative. So all, all the iterative methods are usually stochastic. So if you run it multiple times, you would get different results. Um, the next one is SC3. This is our tool that we developed in our group. Um, it's based on, again, on dimensionality reduction, such as PCA, and also we use spectral dimensionality reduction. It also uses k-means. That means that it, it's also stochastic. Uh, and there is one, one step where we uh, create a calculate the consensus of different clustering. So we average different clustering solutions, which makes the final solution more stable. Um, so we also have an example of TCNE plus k-means. This is what I uh, was talking about yesterday, and I didn't recommend that. So we just want to look at how it performs. So you basically perform TCNE uh, em embedding on your data, plot it, well, you don't need to plot it, and then you just run k-means on, on this, in these two, two dimensions that you define. The next one is SNN click. This is also quite old, uh, but that was probably the first uh, uh, graph-based uh, algorithm for single cell RNA-seq data. Um, so in this, in this algorithm, the <coughs> the, the graph is constructed from your data, and then um, they calculate the number of shared nearest neighbors in the graph. And then they also define a click uh, variable here. So, so it, it's, um, I don't know all the details. If you're, again, if you're interested, you can go to the paper and have a look at it. Uh, the last one is Surat. Clustering. So, Surat is, it started as a clustering tool uh, a couple of years ago. And the problem was that uh, what, the, what, what, what happened is that it used uh, TSNE uh, dimensionality reduction to do clustering. So, that's what we say is not good. After that, they changed the, their clustering algorithm to, to a new one which is based on community detection. It's very similar to SNN click described before, but also uses uh, uh, nearest neighbor search algorithm described in this paper, which was originally applied to site of data instead of single cell RNA seq. And also, Serrat has become kind of all-in-one tool, so you can uh, analyze your data completely uh, using Surat package, doing quality control, finding highly variable genes. So that's why we, we separated Surat, uh, description of Surat in a separate chapter. So this would be chapter five, where we'll go through all the steps that you can do in Surat. Um, but here, I'm just introducing the clustering. So there was one algorithm before, which was published from a Costco data set, if you know that the mouse retina data set, 45,000 cells. But now this algorithm is, uh, uh, is neglected, so they use a different one. So, um, to be able to compare different clustering solutions, uh, we need some kind of measure. And for our purposes, we'll, we will use adjusted RAND index. So it, this index changes from zero to one, where zero means that your clusterings are completely different, and one means that your clusterings are identical. So it's a very straightforward and simple measure. The only 
uh, thing you need to keep in mind is your labels. So your clustering labels should be should have the same names. So you, you should be able to compare the labels. If they have different names, it doesn't make sense to compare them. Um, okay, so now we will go through these different tools and uh, cluster a data set and see uh, uh, how the results look like. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is if we, if we can record the, uh, the location of the cell and then when doing clustering, using, use this information uh, to, 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 to do the clustering more accurately, right? Yes, so there are some, I think there are some tools coming uh, in this direction, so when you use uh, in, in addition to a single cell RNA-seq data, you also use uh, the uh, spatial information about the cells. So in this case, you can do clustering in a better way, more accurately. Uh, we don't cover these tools in the course, but probably next time we run it, we will have, we actually, uh, we were working on one of those as well. But yeah, no, so I think the, the way the technology works is that for, if you want to do, get spatial information, there are sort of two types of methods. Uh, one, uh, which is called uh, somewhat confusingly spatial transcriptomics, uh, which the prop the, it gives you genome-wide coverage, but it doesn't give you uh, single cell resolution when it comes to the uh, to the sort of uh, spatial uh, uh, distribution. And then there are these uh, various fish-based methods. Uh, they do give you single cell resolution, but they don't give you genome-wide coverage. They only give you on the order of uh, sort of a hundred different genes, which you can sort of pick yourself, uh, but it, it still sort of make, makes it significantly more limited. And uh, as far as I know, there are no methods out there that uh, is able that, that are able to incorporate the spatial information when doing the clustering. All right, so. Uh to illustrate clustering tools, we will use uh, a DENG data set, which is a data set from developing mouse embryo. <coughs> this was one of the first good quality data set published in single cell and seq data. So we have already processed this data set. So we created a single cell experiment class object. Um, we have normalized it using CPM. So in, in, the, in, the, in the say, which is called log counts, you would have log transform CPM values of your data set. We have also annotated the, dat the data set with the cell types identified in the original publication. So if you look at the annotation of the cells, which is your call data slot in single cell experiment object, Cell type two would be the uh, annotations that were published in the publication. <coughs> there is also cell type one uh, column, which is uh, similar to cell type two, but we merged some of the cell types together because uh, for, for different reasons, I'll explain later. So if you load the data set and if you look at it, as I said, we would have we would have two essays, one counts and log counts. Log counts is log transform CPM values of counts. You have gene names, uh, which are mouse mouse genome, as you can see. We have performed a quality control function, scatter function, so you would have all these um, columns in the annotation matrix added by scatter. Um, so these are cell IDs. Uh, we have 268 cells. These are different IDs. 
And these are also, this is the cell annotation table where we have cell type two, cell type one, and all the skater related columns. Also, there is a spiking uh, uh, slot in this, in this experiment, but we won't use it for the, for the clustering purposes. So um, if we look at the cell type two column, we can, we can get an idea of uh, how many cells you have in different cell types. Well, these are not the cell types. So these are, because this data set is embryo development data set, we have cell stages, stages of the development. So we have 50 cells in 16 cell stage, 14 cells in four cell stage, and so on. So there are stages here which are called early to cell, uh, late to cell, mid to cell. So in the cell type one column, we actually merge this together. Because when you plot them, they look quite similar to each other. But in the original publications, they were separated. Uh, we, <coughs> we merged them. So I think the clustering results become better if you merge them. So this is just an example of what, what you can do if you want to. You can define clusters. Basically, you can define clusters in different ways. So they found these three stages. Uh, you may think that this is not good and just put everything into one stage, just two cell stage. So uh, let's plot the PCA plot of the data set, and we want to color the cells by their cell type, right? Uh, and this is what you see. So what, what's important in this plot is that, um, so we have like 30, 3% of uh, variability on the first principal component. And if you look at the cell types that we have here, so we start from the zygote, which is blue color. Then you have two cell, early two cell. Then you would have mid two cell and so on. So this is actually, you can see, this is a trajectory of your development here. So at the end, you, you will have all the blast blast-related cells, right? So the first principal component describes the variability due to the development stage. Um, and you can see that already in the PCA plot, this uh, cell stages separate nicely. Some of them are mixed together. So for example, eight cell and 16 cell stage kind of grouped together. And also all the blast, early blast, late blast, mid blast, they're also together. So this is just an overview of the data. You can actually run k-means algorithm on these two components and it will find and ask for say four clusters. So it will find this one, this one, this one, and this one. So you will already have four clusters, which makes sense. But we will start with SC3 tool. So SC3 uh, has single cell experiment integration, so you can run it directly on your single cell experiment object. It also has uh, a function which can estimate the number of clusters for you. So uh, if we run it, it, it says that there are six clusters which is, if you compare it to the original labels, it's not the same number as the original labels in the publication. So here we have 10 clusters, right? SC3 finds six, um, which as I said, can make sense if you merge some of the cell types. So depending on how you define the cell types, uh, your K can change. So, um, Okay, so here actually, if we plot uh, the same PCA plot, but we will use the merged cell types where we merged all the stages of two cell and all the stages of blast together, you will see that actually this becomes one group. Here you have nice separation of stages, but these two guys, which is eight and 16, are still, uh, 
they should be probably separate. They're a bit separated, but kind of very close to each other. Um, so if, if we use SC3 prediction, probably six clusters is actually good because this is kind of unsupervised prediction of your number of K. So now we can run SC3. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think the question is, what's the difference between cell type one and cell type two? I think it has <coughs> okay, so the question is, uh, yeah, so I, I, I will explain this. There is a confusion between cell type two and cell type one. So cell type two are the cell labels defined by the authors of the publication, right? So they used their own clustering algorithm and they probably used some marker genes to define the cell types. Uh, cell type one are the exactly the same labels as cell type two, but you only merged all the labels with two cell together and all the labels with BLAST together. So here you had early two cell, late two cell, and mid two cell. You merge them together, this become two cell. And then you merge BLAST, mid BLAST, late BLAST, and early BLAST together, this becomes BLAST. And then if you plot it, this is exactly the same plot, but you merge the cell types together. So we haven't, this, this is not a class, we haven't done any clustering yet. This is just merging of the cell types. So now we can run SC3 on the DENC date set. As I mentioned before, SC3 is based on k-means clustering, so you have to define uh, the number of clusters k here. The cool thing about SC3 is that you can define a range of k's. So you can check uh, several k's at the same time, and then you can visualize and see what are the differences between different k's. So here we run it only for k equals 10, but you can define this as k equals from 8 to 12 and look at different clustering solutions. Yes? Um, why does it need to be 10 to 10 when there are no sets of k's? Because the original uh, labels have 10 cell types, so I just wanted to run it against the original, original cell labels. You can run it against six as well, yeah. So this estimation function, um, the estimation uh, function here is not, this is, you can trust it or not. This is just, uh, it gives you an idea of how many clusters you could have approximately. So this is not the, the right answer. So you can, you can play around this number, but because we, in this data set, we knew the original cell types, we, we decided just to run it with the same number of clusters to see whether C3 can reproduce the results of the original publication. So the question is, do we often say uh, set K higher than the estimate? Uh, no, I, uh, I think it, it, again, it depends on, uh, so, I mean, I, th I think something? in this case, uh, choosing six is actually quite well motivated because if you look at the, the, la the names of the clusters, so, to, so you have uh, the two cells, right, which is grouped into early, late, and mid, early, mid, and late, and same with the blastocyst, uh, early, late, and mid. So, so that basically, so if you merged the early, late, and mid into one cluster, right, for both of those two groups, you would get rid of four, you'd lose four clusters and you'd end up with six instead of ten. So from that point of view, uh, you could argue that the sort of the uh, subdivision into 10 clusters is actually sort of too, too fine-grained, and, and six might be a good answer. And uh, uh, in general, I think it is the case that 
there are usually more than one good answer to uh, the number of, of k because you can sort of, depending on <coughs> your view of the system of how fine-grained it should be, you can end up with two sort of quite different, no, different choices of k and it, it's all based on sort of how you interpret it. Yeah. Yes, so y you can subset genes as you wish. This is, but again, the purpose of this clustering algorithm, I mean, the purpose of any unsupervised clustering is you want to use all the genes in your data set. You don't want to concentrate on some small subset because then your approach becomes more biased, right? So yeah, you, but you, you can still do it. There is no problem with that. But yeah, I think if you, if you have single cell RNA-seq data, so y you kind of have to use all genes because it gives you more information about the cell state. <coughs> yeah. Okay, so the question is, uh, instead of running uh, everything on, on the whole data set with all genes, uh, can we define top 2,000 highly variable genes in the beginning and then run everything on top 2,000 highly variable genes? So my answer would be, if you think that your 2,000 highly variable genes describe completely your system, you can do it. But, and, and also it depends on how you define your highly variable genes. What, what is the method that you use? There are several methods that can help you with that, but if you just use the variance as a, as a measure, are you sure that these genes are the most important ones in your data set? That's the question. So that's what I'm, I, I'm my, my message is that you have information about all the genes. So why don't you use all of it instead of subsetting to some specific set of genes? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, when you work with biologists, they always have their own opinion about the data set. So you say you find six clusters, but they say there, there should be 15 clusters. And they want you to find those 15 clusters anyway. Uh, I think this is, this is a very common problem. Uh, you can't avoid it, I suppose. But I think once, if you define your clusters ob objectively, in an unsupervised manner, and you s you definitely you're definitely sure that there is six clusters and no more. Uh, going down and trying to find more clusters becomes more subjective. <coughs> so you can always do that. You can probably find a couple of genes which, if you cluster based on those genes, you will you will find those clusters. But this is I think this is more specific to the system that you study and more subjective. So. It depends on uh, what questions you are answering with your study, right? So if you if you are doing some general cell type investigation, then you don't want to be very specific. If you are studying a couple of genes, then you can do that, I suppose. Yep.
So the question is, the question is when you have your real data set, you don't know the cell types, what would you do, right? Um, so the answer is here we, we know the cell type and we know it, we use it just for demonstration purposes, right? So I'm, I'm using this information just to show you how the data set looks like and also I can calculate the accuracy of the clusterings of different methods because I know the ground truth. So I use it as a ground truth. In your real data set, you, you won't plot these plots in the beginning. You first will do clustering. It will find your clusters, and then you will try to label the clusters based on the genes that are <coughs> meaningful, more abundant in those clusters, right? So you would go in from different direction. Here we start with this because we know the ground truth. So I think the question is about rare cell types, right? Very small. When you have a data set, you have lots of cells, but your cell type consists of only a few cells, like maybe two or three, right? So there are some algorithms uh, which deal exactly with this problem. The ones that I am presenting here are more general. So they, they would try to separate things in, into large groups. So as I said, there is no universal clustering algorithm. So depending on the question that you have, depending on your data set, you sometimes would use a different algorithm, which is more specific to your purposes. Um, okay, so have you run the clustering by SC3? Did it work? No errors? So, um, after you run the SC3 clustering, you can visualize the results by using different plotting functions. So one of them is called SC3 plot consensus. Uh, so you, you, can actually, you can just run this uh, line of code. <coughs> and what it does, um, so as I mentioned in the description of SC3, SC3 runs different couple of dimensionality reductions and also it uses different uh, distance measures to calculate distances between the cells. Then by combining all these different parameters, it will calculate lots of different clustering solutions. And then at the end, it will collapse all these clustering solutions into one by using consensus approach. And what you see here is the consensus matrix uh, for the data set. And in the consensus matrix, you have cells in row, in columns, and also you have cells in rows. <coughs> so this matrix is symmetric, as you can see. Symmetric, symmetric uh, um, by this diagonal, and then uh, the colors in the heat map correspond to si similarity between the cells. So if if the color is red, then it means the cells are belong to the same cluster. If the color is blue, it means that the cells belong to different clusters. And uh, this is the result of several clustering algorithms. So it, it's, a, it's a consensus agreement of different clustering solutions. Um, so what we want to see on this uh, consensus plot is something like that. So it's a block diagonal structure. So you have red blocks on the diagonal and blue blocks of the diagonal, which means that if you take this cell and this cell find the intercept between them. So most of the clustering solutions agree that these two cells belong to the same cluster. If you take this cell and this cell, most of the clustering solutions agree that they don't belong to the same cluster, right? So because we asked for 10 clusters, SC3 found 10 clusters for us. So there are two clusters which only contain a few cells. So this, this is uh, probably an artifact of clustering. This is not very good. Uh, and also in SC3, when we plot this matrix, we can 
also visualize the original cell types uh, using colors, right? So SS3 found these 10 clusters for us, but we also visualize the original clusters from the publication. And as you can see, here we have SS3 put this, these cells into one cluster, even though in the original uh, publication those were eight cells and 16 cells. So if you remember the PCA plot before, on the PCA plot, eight cells and 16 cells, they were grouped together. So SS3 actually found the same thing here. Uh, but then, for example, we have this cell type, which is hard to say whether it's an early blast or 16 cell, right? So, but it's, it's kind of separated. It's either half of 16 cells or it's uh, early two cell block, uh, stage. Mid blast was also separated in a separate, in a one cluster, which is good. So uh, its solution is not perfect, as you can see, but still we recover some structure of the data. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, uh, so here we have, if, if this is cell types, uh, sorry, if this is 16 cell stage and this is a 16 cell stage, why were they separated and what would be the explanation for them, right? Biologically. Biologically. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned, in your real data set, you would not have these colors, right? So when you have, when you cluster your data, you would have to believe what you see here, right? So uh, by looking at the genes, which are specific to this cluster and to this cluster, you can find some biological explanation why they were separated, because there is a reason for that. So the algorithm found that these cells do not look similar to these cells. They should be separated. But we use the colors here because we know the original cell labels just to compare SS3 solution to the original data, right? So I don't know why they were separated. You should have, you should look at the genes that are specific to this different cluster. Um, but again, SS3 recommended us six clusters, right? So if you go uh, to numbers more than six, you will, you will start getting this artifacts where it separates. It can't find a large cluster, so it, it just separates one or two cells into a separate cluster. Yeah? My clustering turned out to be different. And I tried, I tried to do colorization, but it didn't work. So I just wanted to see if there was a certain number of clusters where we didn't achieve the issue. It's always one or the other one. So we're saying to you, yes, so so the question is, SC3 is stochastic, so if you run it multiple times, you run, you get different results. You can fix the random seed in SC3 as in PCE maps as we did yesterday. Uh, I know, I know this problem. I haven't, I haven't looked at it yet. So when we, when I developed SC3, I thought I fixed random seed everywhere, but apparently some way it changes. So. I need to look at it more closely. Well, it, it, it can be not very different, but it changes the solution. The problem is it changes somewhere. Did you get the same plot now? Everyone got the same plot? You got a different one? Sorry? I have a question. But the plot, everyone got the same plot. So it worked, it worked today, yeah. So I need to look at it. There is a problem. Yeah. What assumption does came? 
the date is what? Spherical. Uh, well, yeah, so the question is k means requires spherical data assumption. What do you mean by spherical data? Okay. Yeah, okay. So, um, okay, so the question is k means cannot be used on any data set. So it requires, it has some assumptions underneath. So if k means cannot be used, what can we do in this case? So, I mean, we here we perform uh, distance calculations. So we have several distance measures. Uh, and this kind of makes some internal scaling of the data. So you don't just run it on the raw, datas, raw data values. Uh, I'm not sure whether it makes data more spherical. It should, I suppose. Uh, but if you don't believe in k-means, then you probably should use another clustering tool. So we, we tested. Uh, I know, I, well, every, every clustering algorithm has some assumptions, right? So, but you can always run it and see what happens on this particular data set. So we tested SC3 on different single cell RNA-seq data sets, and it worked quite well. So in the paper, we have some benchmarking. You can have a look at it. But of course, yeah, we don't, we don't satisfy all the mathematical assumptions behind the algorithm, obviously. We can't do that. If we, if we start doing it, we will never finish with clustering. We'll never develop a clustering tool, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the answer is that the k-means clustering, the sort of, the, the method is only guaranteed to work if your clusters are sort of uh, of Gaussian nature and sort of reasonably separated. Uh, I think if you do the sort of log transformation of the data and it's not too much, you don't have too many zeros in there, it, it should be reasonably Gaussian. Uh, so, but of course, the, the second problem has to do with separation of clusters, which obviously if, the, if two clusters aren't properly separated, you're never going to be able to distinguish them. Uh, so that, that's any method is going to have that problem. Okay, the, ne the next plot we can uh, visualize is called silhouette plot. So you can plot it using SC3 plot silhouette function. Uh, and this plot uh, gives you an idea of how good your clustering solution is. So it's also, it's, it's based on the consensus matrix that we saw before. But uh, here it, it's for, for each cluster, it says uh, how confident uh, your solution is uh, that these two cells, that this cell belong to this cluster. So the, the, the higher values you have in each cluster, the better. So for example, we can see that for these two clusters, uh, the silhouette is almost one, which means the solution tells you that definitely these cells are belong to the same cluster. Here it's a bit lower, so there is some degree of uncertainty uh, for, for these clusters as well. So here you, like, you're 50% confident that your cells belong to the same cluster. But you can also see that this is, I think this corresponds to the color uh, in your blocks. So the more yellow color you have in your blocks, the lower is the silhouette. So if they're completely red, then you would have one value, value of one in silhouette. So it's just a, um, some quantitative measure of your block diagonal structure. Um, you can also visualize expression of your genes in each cluster by running SC3 plot expression. So again, we have all our clusters and now on, on the uh, y-axis you have genes. For simplicity, the genes are clustered into 100 uh, clusters instead of, because plotting all the genes is, is, is very computationally expensive and it takes a lot of time. So 
SC3 clusters genes, again using k-means, but in, in, in 100 groups. But it gives you an idea of how the expression of the genes look like and why uh, SC3 separated cells into this cluster. So, you, yeah. How do you decide the mechanism of trace? This one's. We just we just run it. Uh, it's basically it's the package that plots this heat map. It has a parameter k means you just say 100, and it will just run k means on real uh, gene values. It's it's it doesn't have any meaning. It just puts genes into 100 groups, and then you visualize. Yes, if you run it multiple times, but you don't you don't see the gene names here anyway. So you're not interested in the gene names. You want to see why SC3 separated your clusters into different groups. So I mean, this uh, the rows can be rearranged if you run it multiple times, but they will still be the same, right? Um, so yeah, you can see, for example, for this cluster. Uh, the expression of genes here uh, is very visible. So that's why they were put in, in one cluster. Even though they have different uh, labels in the original data set, these are probably late two cell and four cell, which, which are quite similar to each other. So late two cell and four cell, they are like n next to each other in, in the stage hierarchy. So SC3 put them together. And then you can, you can just see uh, different uh, gene expression here. In addition to that, we can also plot marker genes for each cell type. So this would be kind of zooming in to the, previ <coughs> to the previous plot and finding out what are the genes, the most expressed genes in each cluster. So if you do mouse embryo development biology, you probably can find out some gene names which are, you are familiar with. Yeah. Sorry? Ah. Um, so the question is which, where to put these gene names in your original data, in your data set object. So in SC3 there is a, there has to be a column in, uh, in, the, in the raw data, which is related to genes, raw data slot of single cell experiment object. And the name of the column has to be feature symbol or feature symbols. So it's, it's documented in SC3 documentation you can you can have a look so it will use this column to uh, to plot this na gene names on this graph uh, if you don't have it then it will probably use the uh, row names of your row data slot sometimes this can be ensemble IDs which don't make sense on the plot so they will they will not tell you much So now we can also plot PCA again, but we want to color the cells by SC3 clusters. So now instead of using original cell labels, we say we want to use clustering solution uh, of SC3. Uh, and this is how it looks like. So we don't know the labels because when you run clustering, you find the clusters, then you have to label them. We haven't done that yet. Right, so it, it gives you a cluster number, and you can see why those cells were separated in, in a separate cluster. And now we would like to compare our results with the original cell types. So the original cell types was in the cell type two column of our data set. In SC3 results are in SC310 clusters column of the whole data slot of our data set. So if we run adjusted random index function, it gives us 0 
which is which is pretty good. So adjusted rent index higher than 0 0.7 is usually quite good match uh, between two clustering solutions. So even though solutions look different, quantitatively they are quite similar to each other, right? Any questions? Okay. So also SC3 allows you to run uh, to be run in interactive manner. So if you if you run this function, it will open it will open SC3 in, in your web browser and you can see you, you will be able to see all these plots that we plotted manually uh, in a interactive manner. So you don't need to uh, plot them manually if you don't want to. And also here we only run SC3 for 10 clusters. So K was had a single value. If you run it for a, re, for a range of clusters, for example, from 8 to 12, and then open it in an interactive session, you can change K from 8 to 12, and you will see how your consensus matrix changes depending on your K. So sometimes you can, you can find uh, a better block diagonal structure in your consensus matrix by changing K. <coughs> And th this is was this was the original idea to make uh, to make it more convenient for the user to find out what what's a good K for this data set can be. Well, actually, we have this as a, as an exercise uh, to, uh, to run SC3 from eight to twelve. Uh, so there is one note here uh, because of the. Uh, distance calculations and the number of different parameters that we use in clusterings, SC3 becomes very slow if you run it for more than 5,000 cells. So uh, we recommend you, uh, using it for small data sets. It, it's very accurate uh, and it works nicely. If you have more than 5,000 cells, you better start using SERAT because uh, it can work with up to 10, 10 to the 5 uh, cells. So you can go through the exercises now. I will do it the, sa the same on my computer. And then we move forward to the next methods. 